Good morning, guys. I hate we're all sparkly. Ice bath done, gym session, run the dogs. I'm about to do something very cool, but I can't tell you about it. Oh, shall I? Uh, no, we'll save it for another video. But I've had to pop into clinic because I have to sort an issue out. I like the poem. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I do like the occasional poem. <laughs> if by Roger Kipling. And a line that sticks out to me. If you can treat triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You've got to ride with the punches, haven't you? You've got to get on with it. Nobody cares. Work harder. Appreciate the highs and learn from the lows. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to do a quick video. As you guys know, we offer diagnostic screening and this guy is super interesting. He is mid forties of Asian origin. And he had the blood test essentially because he was tired and he was suffering from brain fog. So logically you would think, yep, he's a potential candidate for testosterone deficiency. But the purpose of this comprehensive blood screen is to look not only at the hormones, but to look at everything else to see if we can identify what might be causing this potential hormone dysregulation, but also look to other things because it's not all just testosterone. Whilst testosterone is the fundamental hormone necessary for anabolism, growth and repair, it is just a part of the puzzle. An important part, the foundation, but just part. So we're actually going to go straight to the nitty gritty, his hormones. So we'll start with his pituitary hormones, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone and prolactin. All bang in the middle. So if he does have a problem... It's a mixed picture. We go to his estradiol, 115. Perfect. We go to his testosterone now. This guy is natural. He has not done serms. He's not done anything to create this. 37.4. So this guy, at 45 years old, has superhuman testosterone levels. So why does he feel rubbish? Because it's more complicated than just testosterone. So you'll know there's a certain group on the internet that just think more is better, but it's the law of diminishing returns. More isn't always better. So what's going on with this guy? Well, if you know a little bit about this subject, you'll know that it's SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. Now his level is 75. Now, we know that a high normal SHBG confers health benefits. It's good for insulin sensitivity. And again, we want a high normal SHBG because the SHBG acts as a buffer and it helps modulate the ratio of testosterone to estradiol and DHT. So what is this ratio? We know his estradiol is 115, but his free testosterone is actually 0.494. So the ratio of testosterone to estradiol is actually pretty healthy. So why is he feeling rubbish? Because it's more complicated than this, isn't it? So let's look to causes of raised SHBG. Now, fundamentally, we first looked at the thyroid to see if he's hyperthyroid. And um, no, he's actually slightly hypothyroid with a slightly elevated TSH, but a very normal free T3 and free T4. So that's not the reason for his raised SHBG. So we also looked at the liver. Is there anything going on with the liver? Well, he has a slightly elevated AST and ALT. So is he a chunky monkey? That tends to result in low SHBG. Is there any issue with alcohol? No, nothing with alcohol, his gamma GT is normal and he reports no heavy drinking. And in fact, this guy has a super healthy lifestyle. He has more of a bodybuilding diet. So he eats five to six times a day and obviously trains hard because he's into obviously bodybuilding. But again, no naughty substances. So what's going on? Well, where else should we look? Well, we look to obviously what might be causing raised SHBG from a lifestyle perspective. Has this guy got good sleep? Because 
one of the reasons why people have raised SHBG, and this is not well documented in the literature, is obstructive sleep apnea and poor sleep. Because what is that? That is a stress state. And we know that SHBG goes up in stress states. Now, as I said, we want a high normal SHBG, but when it gets to too high, it's obviously pathological because it's not allowing for a sense of well-being that you want. And whilst on paper, the ratios are healthy, he's subjectively not feeling good. So he's not fasting. So we know that fasting raises SHBG. He's not calorie restricting. So we know that calorie restriction raises SHBG. So what on earth is going on with this guy? Well, let's look to his other markers. So he's got a slightly raised creatinine. And obviously, if he's a bodybuilding type guy, he's going to have a high protein diet and obviously more musculature than the average person. And with these superhuman testosterone levels, of course he has. No, you're going to need massive amounts of testosterone for anabolism. So when you're in your 40s, what do you really expect to gain? Well, you want to achieve your genetic potential, obviously, but you're not going to become Arnold Schwarzenegger, even with the testosterone of 35. And if this guy had a slightly higher free T, and we don't see higher free T's really naturally. We only see these higher free T's on testosterone replacement therapy. You're not going to create more muscle. So achieving your genetic potential and maximizing your genetic potential and perhaps slightly surpassing your genetic potential from the fact that you don't have the corresponding anabolic versus catabolic. You're always slightly anabolic. So you are optimized. But again, it's the law of diminishing returns. Too much is too much testosterone, which means the counterbalance cortisol can't keep up. And if you get a drop in cortisol, you're going to be reliant on your excitatory neurotransmitters. And what's that going to create? That's going to create anxiety. And we don't like anxiety states. So it's paradoxical, isn't it? You say you raise testosterone to feel good, but you get anxiety because the counterbalance can't keep up. Again, what's it all about? One more time, guys. Balance, baby. Yin yang. So. What else is going on? This guy's HbA1c, so this is the measure of glucose control over three months, is normal, 37. High normal, but we know that obviously he's engaging in a bodybuilding-esque diet and not calorie restricting or carb restricting. So yeah, very normal, frankly. His lipid profile, unremarkable. So again, he's got a slightly elevated cholesterol. And we know that cholesterol converts into pregnenolone, so we don't want low cholesterol, but we want to reduce the inflammation that might be causing raised cholesterol but he's got that nice counterbalance of hdl so super healthy his hematinics so the things that help make up the red blood cells his ferritin very normal he didn't do the complete plus which is our more comprehensive test that also looks at b12 folate vitamin d and zinc that may have given us a little bit of information but not really for this guy, because we're trying to find out why he's got a raised SHBG. So full blood count, what's that looking like? Very normal. So again, when we talk about sleep apnea, we're looking to see if the hemoglobin in hematia is raised and it's not, it's actually perfect. And obviously Asian origin, we're thinking about whether he's got thalassemia and obviously he doesn't have that because he's got a good, nice, healthy HB and his MCV is bang in the middle. So what's going on with this guy? Well, as I've said, it's super complicated, but what we do know is he's got a high SHBG with this massively elevated testosterone. It's so strange, isn't it? Well, what we'd normally think is obviously if the brain is recognizing the fact that he's got low free testosterone, and we know that obviously the estradiol the testosterone and DHT feed back to the hypothalamus and pituitary to tell the brain that you have enough testosterone. So it's a little bit odd, isn't it? Because you would think with a good free testosterone of 0.495 and a healthy estradiol of 115, that this guy should be flying. But if you're thinking, okay, the brain must be stimulated, so it must be producing lots of LH and FSH to produce all of that testosterone, because it's recognizing that that's suboptimal for this guy, it's not, is it? Because the LH and, L and FSH are bang in the middle. So what else might be going on? Well, there's a genetic component. And also, it could be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So what I've recommended to this guy is to go back to his GP, 
present these results and ask for the test because then that will give us some concrete evidence as into why his SHBG is elevated. So what can you do about it? Well, we have an article on our website about SHBG. If you haven't read it already, read it because it's super important to understand a little bit more about health than we currently do. It's limited, isn't it, frankly? So he's going to have to optimize all of those things to help lower SHBG. But I've just said we like SHBG, but with him, it's pathological. So we want to lower SHBG. So all the things that we talk about, but actually he's doing them in already. So what else can we do? Well, there is some evidence to suggest that boron can be helpful. Now it's between six and 10 milligrams, but I really prefer six milligrams just to see if it will help modulate SHBG. But when we're armed with all the information, we can have a considered approach to the patient. When we only have limited information and we listen to the internet, we have a very limited approach and we rely on anecdotes. Anecdotes on the internet are not helpful because what are they? No anecdotes. And again, we look to the research because obviously the research is super important. Well, the research is always limited. And again, you take the research, you take your knowledge and you apply it clinically. So this guy hopefully will get some information from the GP. He's going to come back to me and for, uh, we're going to counsel him with regards to what he can do and what he can't do. So obviously testosterone replacement therapy is not in this guy's future at this juncture. So it's likely I'm going to send him away with the typical advice that I'd give to somebody with high SHBG and we'll review him as and when to see whether his pituitary responds and then essentially drops the testosterone to render him hypogonadal. So it is a good idea to have annual screening just to see where you are. And again, you want to discuss this with a clinician that knows what he's talking about, not the internet. Well, rant over, have a great day, day guys, and do what? Yeah, go earn your reward.